what you see here is you see me in my virtual studio. So if you thought this was going to be a sort of standard zoomy like session, that's it. You can get me walking around like this. So this is my principle of uh, disruption. You know, as a traditionally as a keynote speaker, I'd be walking around a stage. So whereas now I'm walking around a green room. Um, so as uh, Robert said, yeah, my name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the CEO and founder of the 311 Institute and the World Futures Forum. So. Uh, we're typically a global think tank. We work anywhere between the modern day, but I see them 50 years out. Um, the reason why we work between such an extreme set of timelines is because if you're a multinational organization uh, or a company, typically you want to see anywhere between what's happening today to maybe the next 20 years out. You know, most organizations like a view of say five to 10, anywhere beyond 10 and you know, it's nice and science fiction. But if you're a sovereign government uh, like the UAE, the US, UK, Germany, like you know, the Netherlands, um, you want to see a little bit further out. So your point of view really starts in some cases 20 years and out, particularly when we start looking at the future of skills, infrastructure, energy, jobs, education, you know, banking, all those kinds of things. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be taking you through uh, what we've called building the finance organization of the future. Now, this particular presentation is designed to get you thinking. It is designed to get you on edge. It is designed to get you to, to discussing all these different things that I'm going to be showing you. So this is my unfettered presentation on my view of the future finance organization. And love it or loathe it, I hope you have some good discussions basically on the back end of it. And we'll ask all those uh, sort of questions afterwards. Um, so I work with the Can you hear me okay? Yeah. That's all right. Oh, well, that's, that's fine. That's just the title slide. Um, so uh, can you hear me OK, though? OK, that's good. So these are sort of the teething problems don't necessarily have on stage. It's sort of one of the problems. Yeah, ordinarily, when I'm on stage, you've sort of got a 70 foot screen, which you can put slides onto. But inevitably, you end up then trying to pack slides either onto a person's smartphone or a 17 inch laptop. That's it. So uh, we end up with this kind of sort of random sort of uh, COVID experience that we have. Um, so, yeah, I work with a whole variety of different organizations. And in fact, you know, when you have a look at companies like Arm, almost 100 percent of all the world's data flows through Arm. When you have a look at some of the smartphone providers like Huawei, uh, like Samsung, you know, we typically now understand what the next 50 years of those devices actually look like. Um, and the entire world is changing. So irrespective of what industry you sit in or reside in, or what industry you're interested in, everything is being turned upside down. Um, so this sort of brings me to what I call the time traveler's dilemma. And if you sort of step back to the 1980s and I was able to have conversations with the leaders of the time and said, I have perfect knowledge of the year 2021. And in the year 2021, I see that there's going to be a huge demand for software developers, cybersecurity specialists, uh, for data scientists, and all these kinds of things that we actually know are in demand today. They would have actually firstly asked me maybe a question like, you know, well, what is a cybersecurity specialist? And I would have said, well, cybersecurity specialist is a person who help secure things across the internet because there are lots of nefarious people around the world who now want to try to steal things using the internet as a medium, for example. They would have then asked me this question, bearing in mind that this is really just 40 years ago. They would have then said, what's the internet? I'd have replied, well, the internet is a system, is a distributed system of computers and protocols that has changed the planet. Over three and a half billion people on the planet use the internet. It has disrupted and changed the way that everybody works, plays, and entertains one another. And at that point, they'd have shown me this, the door. Um, I could also have done the same with the automotive manufacturers about 10 years ago and said, in 10 years' time, I think companies like Mercedes and Volkswagen 
will be building cars that drive themselves, that are electrified, that they no longer sell to consumers, but they sell as a service. Again, I'd have probably been shown the door in many cases. And there are lots and lots of industries that are like this. So when we have a look at disruption, disruption today is faster than it's ever been. You know, if you have a look at the amount of time that it took people to adopt the telephone, yeah, it typically took about 75 years for 50 million people to start using the telephone. Yeah, today, basically, you can adopt Pokemon Go. You know, when we have a look at Pokemon Go, um, it was downloaded 50 million times in just 19 days. Call of Duty was downloaded 100 million times, basically, in just a couple of days. Uh, we are increasingly at the point where when you have an increasingly digital society that is increasingly hyper-connected, you can change the world in a day. And using a financial services example, there is actually one prime example of a single company that about a year-ish ago, year, year and a half ago, could have changed the entire global financial services system in a day. And that's, of course, Facebook Libra. Now, when you have a look at Libra, Libra is a cryptocurrency. Um, the vast majority of central banks, whether it was the Chinese, the European, the UK, basically all the American central banks, said that Libra posed such a threat that it would have changed state control of money almost overnight. Now, if you consider this, if Facebook had managed to convince the regulators to push Libra through its platform, they could have had a, should we say, a cryptocurrency that could have been used by up to 2.2 billion people. In addition to that, there is absolutely no reason why just within the first couple of hours, 100 million people couldn't have been using it. By the end of the day, you could have had a billion people using it if the right incentives were in place. So we can already see a time where these industry giants like Facebook, Alibaba, Baidu, Tennyson, Google, uh, Amazon, and so on and so forth, are running at such a scale that they can disrupt the industry that they're interested in very, very quickly. Um, now, when we have a look at the global ecosystem, for example, the startup ecosystems, um, over the past couple of years, we've had over 100 million new companies registered uh, by entrepreneurs. Now, that represents about a tenfold increase on what that figure was about 10 years ago. So starting a company now, you can start a company faster and cheaper than ever before. So in some of this bucket, this is, these are your new competitors. Um, because in those 100 million company, new companies, there are individuals and entrepreneurs who've been looking at your industry and they're trying to attack different points in your value chain. They then have the right culture. They can identify, they have the skills to identify problems worth solving, and that's the culture of the company. They then try to figure out how to solve those pr new problems that they found or old problems that they found. And this is where they then turn to technology. Because if you want to solve a problem, typically you're using combinations of different technologies to do that. You know, look at the smartphone, for example. It's a combination of hundreds of different technologies and research and innovation efforts. Um, but then once you've created your product, you need to be able to get it into the market. And this is where the market slows down the adoption of that product. Because you've got regulators that might say no. You have insurers that won't accept the liability. Um, you have ethics and moral questions. It might not al culturally align, basically, with you know the the countries or with the demographics that you're trying to sell the products to. Um, but nevertheless, just like the Facebook example, if you can get all of these different levers right, increasingly there is very little reason why you can't now have single entrepreneurs changing and influencing the lives of billions of people around the world faster than ever before. The future and disruption is also more complex. It's more confusing. You know, as I travel around the world in normal times, you know, people typically are a little bit more worried about the future because it's faster. They've got less time to react to what they see. And some of the things basically that sort of cross their threshold, they don't see coming in the first place. So we end up in this kind of spiral, basically, of anxiety. Um, and when we have a look at all the different technologies that you can combine together to create next generation products or services, this is my starburst. Um, I follow over 450 exponential technologies. There are about 180 exponential technologies on this starburst, which goes from sort of 2021 to 2071. 
Um, every single every single technology on this radar, every single dot represents a half a trillion dollar opportunity. And every single dot and every single individual technology either has the ability to disrupt one industry or all of them. If you have a look, for example, at artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is a general purpose technology. You can use it to innovate across industries and innovate a whole variety of sort of new and interesting things. But for example, you know, when we have a look at things like 3D printing and 4D printing, just those two technologies alone basically take aim at the $10 trillion manufacturing industry. When we have a look at bioreactors in the advanced manufacturing space, if I take a stem cell from a chicken, uh, which you can do from a feather, and put it into a bioreactor, I can literally solve global famine. Um, yeah, when we have a look at biotechnology, we'll go into these in a little bit, um, there's a whole variety of new life, ex life extension products basically that are already starting to emerge. Um, when we have a look at computing, you know, we have quantum computers that are now starting to come through. They're kind of commercially available, but really by 2025, there'll be a thousand qubits. Um, and in 2025, you'll be able to use a single quantum computer with a thousand qubits to start cracking 70% of the world's encryption as well as completing specific optimization calculations that would take a normal logical computer, say two and a half billion years in just a couple of minutes. Um, quantum computers themselves have huge implications basically for all industries. We already have biological computers coming on the back of those, chemical computers coming on the back of those, neuromorphic computers that pack something along the size of a super supercomputer that is as big as Summit, which is the US Department of Energy's supercomputer, into something the size of a fingernail um, that can run on a single AA battery. We've got molecular information systems coming through, basically thanks to the US government and uh, DARPA, where you can use different polymers and different constructs, as well as DNA computing, that help you collapse a Google-sized hyperscale data center into something the size of your office table. Um, communications, basically we have 5G, 6G, we've got low Earth orbit satellite systems coming through and they'll benefit you guys and we'll talk about those. Um, from an energy perspective, wireless energy everywhere, um, as well as mini nuclear reactors, we have progress in fusion. And as you can kind of get the idea, as you start going around this wheel, you combine all these different technologies together. That's what makes your next generation product or service. In the intelligence space, we've got narrow artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence in about 2035, artificial super intelligence, which is about 2045. But we've also been able to create AIs in the labs using DNA. We've also been able to 3D print artificial intelligences. It's called a diffractive neural network. So we're already starting to do a lot of science fiction-like things. And technology is just this rocket ship. It keeps accelerating and accelerating. Over time, it gets more powerful, it gets cheaper, and therefore the products and services that you can use it to create get more powerful, just inherently get more powerful themselves. Uh, you know, when we start having a look at things like robotics, we have hard and soft robots coming through. When you have a look at security, um, for example, we've got Morpheus computing platforms where recently 300 hackers were given three months to try and break into a new type of computer chip that self-configures uh, like a Rubik's Cube, and they couldn't. Um, we've got new user interfaces coming through, so digital humans, we've got conversational interfaces coming through, behavioral interfaces coming through, augmented reality, virtual reality, we've got neural interfaces coming through, which if you're in healthcare, that kind of stuff basically is, incre is increasingly important, particularly when we start looking at using brain machine interfaces to read the thoughts of people who are, suffer from locked in syndromes. So. We already live in a science fiction world. But from a traditional organization's perspective, there are these three horizons. Now, most organizations typically live in what we call horizon one. That is kind of the next five years, sort of the two to three years, stretch it to five years. Um, that's where most organizations spend about 95 plus percent of their time. 
Horizon 2, um, that pushes the timeline a little bit further out, say five to 10 years. So this is where we're fundamentally looking to try to reinvent the products that we sell today in new ways. And then we have Horizon 3, and Horizon 3 is where we're trying to literally find new ways to fundamentally do things differently and disrupt the status quo. Now, I would argue that most organizations should spend about 75% of their time in Horizon 1 and then split the other 25% of their time in Horizon 2 and 3 for the simple fact that, as I've already demonstrated, the pace of disruption is accelerating. So the likelihood that you are going to be disrupted and or feel the tentacles of change on your back, which could hurt your company's revenues and or profits or both, um, is increasingly likely. Now, from a banking and finance perspective, yeah, I'm going to now walk you through, and this is sort of where I want to try and get a debate and discussions going. And this is sort of where I'm going to be quite forthright based on what I say here. So in this particular piece, I'm going to discuss how banking got broken. And it's probably not in the way that you thought. So when you have a look at money, you know, we always talk about money, you know, whatever type of money we're talking about, basically as a value store. Personally, I think the vast majority of banks, because I use banks, um, are actually a valueless store. Now, what I mean by that is I give my money that I've earned to my bank. My bank, uh, and I bank with a number of the global banks, then don't pay me any interest on it. They give me nothing back. In fact, they actually start charging me fees and all that kind of stuff. So I give my hard-earned money to my bank. My bank then uses my money to make itself money. That is a fundamentally broken relationship. There is no other relationship on the planet where you give someone else something in order for them to sort of make money in that kind of way. You could argue maybe the big tech giants. Um, but this is sort of why I say banks are a valueless store. And this is sort of what we're going to sort of delve into throughout this presentation. Now, when we have a look at money itself, um, this system has kind of come in by accident more than design. So in 1200 BC, the Chinese basically was trading cowrie shell shells. In fact, the Chinese symbol for money actually resembles cowrie shell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a very good question. Yeah. No. So I will. It's a it's a very good question. I'm going to answer that in a moment. And actually, I was talking to my children this morning because my children have sort of got a hundred pounds in their pocket money. And uh, I asked them, how would they use that to make money? Because they were thinking, well, we'll put it into a bank. And I said, well, if you put a hundred pound, hundred pounds into, into our banks in the UK, in about 10 years, that hundred pounds is probably going to be worth about 102 pounds. You know, there's other systems. So we're going to, that's a good question. We're going to delve into that. Um, see, almost stealing my thunder there. Um, so in 600 BC, we had the first metal coins. Uh, then in 1200, we had printing presses like the Gutenberg printing press, so we had the first paper notes. Then we started seeing in the 1400s and 1500s, banks and governments started centralizing money. And this is where in the 15th century, we ended up with the Medici Bank. And this is really what I think the original purpose of the bank was, to answer your question. If I had a load of cash, around my house, I would take it down to the bank, they would put it in a safe and they would keep it protected for me. They would make sure that it didn't get thieved or robbed. Um, now in the case of the Medici Bank in the 15th century, yeah, they actually did, the service they provided was keeping your money safe. And that's really what a lot of the banks still to do today. You know, I give you money because I trust you and you put my money into a big vault uh, or a digital vault, and it's, I know it's safe. You know, I know that it's going to be very, very difficult for someone to come along and rob you. Um, so that's my va that's your value as a bank to me. You keep my money safe and protected from thieves. Um, but with the Medici Bank, basically, when they sort of had all this money, they thought, well, you know, it's just sitting in our vaults. What could we do with it? And they thought, well, why don't we actually lend it out? Um, and if we lend it out, why don't we charge interest? And this is kind of where the original banking model came from. You know, you give us your money, we will keep it safe. That's our value to you as a consumer. And in return, we're going to use your money, lend it out, and we're going to actually make a profit on lending your money out for you. Um, 
Now, we kind of had Bank 2 coming along, basically in the 1950s. This was Irma, you know, Bank of America started using the Irma platform uh, to automate uh, checking and accounts. Um, and this was kind of the mainframe era of banks. But banks are still operating the same model, you know, 400, 500 years later. And just to, again, to prove this kind of point, the first thing, yeah, when we start having a look at the evolution of money, the next thing that came out was the credit card. So that's the concept of, I'm a financial institution, I lend you money at an APR of 20 plus percent, uh, and that's how I make my money. Now, the first debit cards that let me actually get access to my own money from my own savings accounts to do with what I want to do, actually came out in the 1970s. And in fact, while I was putting this presentation together, it was incredibly difficult to find an example of the first debit card, like a picture. Uh, first credit cards, loads of them. And this is still the model that we're operating today as banks. You know, we're making money from lending out your money. Um, now, we had Bank 3 coming along kind of in the 1970s, 1980s. Uh, and these are sort of the traditional, you know, almost banker, the kind of original bank as a service, you know, with ATMs. Um, in 2009, we had the first crypto, so Bitcoin was, with uh, Nakamoto uh, was, was fashioned, um, and that started upsetting quite a lot of uh, different people around the world, basically for a whole bunch of different reasons, because it's a, pseudom a pseudonymous and anonymous, you know, should we say, store of money, and that's debatable. Um, but from a payments perspective, we can now pay with anything. You know, you can pay with your face. You can pay with a QR code. Basically, if you're over in China with WeChat or whatever it happens to be, I can still pay with my cards. I can pay with contactless, my virtual credit cards or whatever it happens to be. So when we have a look at the different choices that we have in payments now, there are thousands of different ways. Um, and actually, IKEA's got sort of one of my favorite uh, you know, payment methods, uh, pay with time. So over in Dubai, IKEA have actually been trialing time because one of the things that IKEA have been trying to do is they've tried to get people who are far away from the store in Dubai to travel to the store. So what they do is when you download the IKEA app, um, it will track you on Google, using Google Maps and it will figure out how much time you've spent getting to that particular IKEA store. And then when you get to that IKEA store, they take money off your bill. So uh, they call it paying with time and it's Kind of accurate, kind of not, but it's a novel one anyway. Um, now, when we start having a look at, should we say, the digitization of money, you know, particularly as it relates to cryptocurrencies, you know, the vast majority of sovereign, ban sovereign governments are now starting to relent. You've got the People's Bank of China that have now crafted a digital yuan. You've got the ECB that keep talking about a digital euro. You've got the US Fed that keeps talking up. Uh, the digital dollar, and they're increasingly sort of being pushed by China to try and sort of do something there. Um, when you start digitizing a sovereign currency, for example, China have already started rolling theirs out in a variety of different provinces. It fundamentally allows you to find people who are avoiding tax. Um, it kind of kills the cash economy. But more than that, from a government perspective, you can now track spending in real time. And if you see that people in Shenzhen or Szechuan basically aren't buying vegetables for some random reason. Uh, as a local government, basically, you can start enacting a policy that says, for today only, we will take the sales tax off of X, Y, and Z products to try to encourage that stimulus for that part of the economy. Um, so the concept of digital sovereign currencies basically is very interesting, but um, increasingly we're going there. Um, Microsoft last year actually put out this rather random patent. Um, as we start seeing advances in brain machine interfaces, you can now start using your brain waves via a brain machine interface to make money with your mind. So this is where we're making cryptocurrency, but we're using the power of your mind to actually mine crypto. So you know, these are some of the sort of rather strange things that we are able to do today that are completely alien and left of field. Now, when we start having a look at Bank 4, um, increasingly Bank 4 basically will be automated, but more than that, it'll also be autonomous. And there's a difference between automated and autonomous. Um, it will also be low friction, and we'll also increasingly see hyper-personal banking coming through because as we can collect more data about all of the, all of the 
individuals that we care about, um, whether it be via a webcam like this, for example, where you can actually track and monitor my health to see whether or not basically I'm going to die in a couple of years and so whether or not I'm worth lending to. Um, when we talk about hyper-personalization, the advent of particularly sensor-driven systems and artificial intelligence and machine vision fundamentally changed the game of privacy, both online privacy and offline privacy. You'll be able to gather much more information on every individual in the future, even today, uh, using some really quite novel approaches. So for example, using this web camera and technology from Israel and China, you can determine my character, my personality, my intent to criminality. You can determine whether or not I'm lying, basically when you're doing a maybe a video interview of me uh, for a new loan or a mortgage application. Um, you can use the N plus one bullying effect, as we call it in national security terms, to figure out basically the likelihood that I'm going to take your money and run off with it because if you know, because increasingly people are their friends and so on and so forth. So when we talk about the era of hyper-personalization, when we talk about privacy today, we're blowing the barn doors off that. Um, now from a competitive perspective, your competitors are literally everybody. As different industries digitize, the boundaries between all those individual industries disappear, which means that, you know, if you go and have a conversation with a bank today and say, what industry are you in? A bank will obviously say, well, savings, loans, mortgages, accounts, you know, insurance, whatever it happens to be. If you have a conversation basically with a car company, they'll say, well, we're in the business of making and selling cars. Um, retail, we're in the business of selling stuff. When we have a look at the tech giants and you go and ask that very same question to a tech giant like Google, like Facebook, like Amazon, like Alibaba, they have a fundamentally different answer. Their answer is we are in every industry. And they're right because they can jump from one industry to another and the evidence is there for yourselves to see. They can jump from one industry to another very, very quickly because their data, they are, they're data driven, they are platformed, basically, and they're digital. Um, so when we have a look at traditional banks, traditional banks basically are, typically have a huge amount of legacy technology. You know, the vast majority of banks will be sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars worth of legacy tech, you know, mainframes, yeah, it's 400s, those kinds of things, um, let alone code, and I'll come to that in a moment, or a little bit later on. Um, legacy business models, because again, still take my money, then you don't really give me much back in return, um, and you loan my money out and you make profit on that. You know, what's it? there's nothing in that for me, really, frankly. Um, and then legacy thinking. Uh, and even fintechs suffer from this legacy, legacy thinking. And I'll show you what I mean there. So when you have a look at fintechs, fintechs increasingly are trying to own the customer. They are not interested in owning the back-end office stuff because that's expensive, it's legacy. They don't want that. Um, they want the customer. So what they're trying to do is they are trying to disintermediate you from your customers as a traditional bank. And the way they do that is by creating these elegant, very slick, very seamless uh, customer experience uh, apps, systems, processes, and so on. Now, this is an interesting little chart. I had to dig a lot to find these numbers. Um, so in 2019, because pandemic's a special year, but in 2019, in the US and Europe, about 64% of all new primary bank accounts were opened with fintechs. So I'm looking at the numbers in red here. The cost of opening those bank accounts from a fintech's perspective by their own admissions is pretty much zero. And the cost of maintaining and operating those bank accounts over time, for example, if we have a look at Monzo, uh, according to their own figures, is about 25 euros, 25 to 40 euros a year to operate, to, to sort of look after your bank account. Um, now, the figure, the 71% figure is what interests me because 64% of people opened a primary bank account with a fintech. And the fintechs opened and managed those accounts at very, very low operating costs. But 
71% of people who opened a, prime, a new primary bank account with a traditional established bank put more than 100 euros into their savings accounts. What you'll find basically is more people are opening bank accounts with fintechs because you know, they have marketing, they've got slick ex user experiences, you know, all that kind of stuff. But from a trust perspective, because they aren't highly capitalized, et cetera, et cetera, I'm still going to put my more of my money with a traditional bank because a traditional bank has got a massive digital vault, spends lots and lots of money on cybersecurity, is liquid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, regulated. Um, so this presents traditional banks with an opportunity, and we'll discuss that. Now, from a fintech's perspective, things like open banking actually plays right into their hands because they can, once they've disintermediated the customer, they can then say, you know, using open banking, we can see all your other bank accounts. Why don't you actually consolidate basically those personal finance management systems on, into us? And so they use their slick interface basically to get customers to use their platform more than your platform. And when you start having a look at all of these fintechs, they operate the same business model as the, as the Medici Bank. All of them. They take your money, they don't really give you that much in return, and they loan that money out. And then they charge you fees, you know, for your debit card, for transactions, whatever it happens to be. So for all their bluster, fintechs really are just older banks with a much more modern user experience. And frankly, probably a bit of a better marketing message as well. Um, but they still operate the same business model. Now, when we have a look at big tech versus everyone, you've got new world, new rules, new game. Um, from a big tech perspective, say, for example, you take an Amazon, you know, if Amazon actually turned its prime members into bank account holders, Amazon overnight would become the US's third largest bank. Although at the moment it doesn't look like they want to do that, but yeah, nevertheless, yeah, Amazon could quite quickly rise to being the US's third largest bank. Now, if I was a fintech, if I was a, a big tech giant, you know, like Amazon, when you have a look at Amazon's business model, when you have a look at Facebook, when you have a look at Google, when you have a look at Apple, when you have a look at Samsung, who are a tech giant in their own right, uh, for different reasons, when you have a look at Alibaba, they all want to try to automate as much as the, of the stack as possible. They want everything to be as autonomous po as possible, and they want to disintermediate everything. So from a big tech perspective, they aren't really interested in having that personal relationship with a customer. You know, it's like Netflix. How many of you have ever spoken to anybody at Netflix? None of you, I'll bet. Um, it's kind of, that's the kind of big tech model today. You know, uh, do business with us. We will automate the heck out of everything. And uh, if you do want to get hold of us, you know, we've got a digital human on the end of the line uh, or a bot or whatever it happens to be. Yeah, that's their model. Now, the other model basically that's uh, also interesting, and this is sort of what I was having a conversation with the children around this morning with their 100 pounds, is the DeFi model. Uh, so decentralized finance model. Um, because if I've got my 100 pounds, increasingly technology today lets me kind of become my own financial institution. Um, you know, I could create my own crypto exchange. I could create a decentralized exchange. Basically, I could look at NFTs. I could look at flash loans. So from a flash loans perspective, if I've got £100, I could loan that to my friends. And I could loan that to my friends at a 10% interest rate, undercut the banks, um, and actually still make more money than I would actually on a bank, on a traditional bank account. So uh, from my children's perspective, this is an interesting model. I think if you combine things like decentralized finance with a fintech model, you end up with really something quite intriguing, which is obviously open for discussion, but just putting that out there. Um, now, again, when you're having a look at your traditional competitors, you know, you're looking at companies like Fatbag, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Tencent, ba you know, Baidu, Alibaba, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Are you looking in the right place though? Because yes, they're a threat basically to your business and your industry. What about Fortnite? Are you looking at the gaming industry? So Fortnite has over 200 million customers. And last year, in 2019, they made $1.8 billion in microtransactions. Now what would happen, you know, if you have a look at Apple and Google, they're trying to play to the millennial card. 
My kids basically are increasingly engaged with Minecraft, Roblox, Fortnite, you know, these kinds of uh, gaming platforms. What would happen if Fortnite went, you know what, we're sitting on billions of dollars in cash. Um, why don't we actually create a Fortnite credit card or a Fortnite payment system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, at the moment, again, these gaming companies aren't really interested in becoming a bank. But in terms of delivering, dif being able to deliver different financial or uh, financial services products at scale, I mean, when you have a look at Fortnite, 200 million active users, that puts them on the same par as Twitter. It doesn't put them in the same category as Facebook. But nevertheless, you know, that's a massive customer base just waiting to be flipped. And microtransactions are coming under scrutiny by the regulators now. But nevertheless, yeah, you know, when you have a look at the growth in esports and all these different platforms, the, yeah, you could have Fortnite, the bank. Um, now, when we have a look at future banking customers, you know, as Steve Jobs famously said, uh, you know, start with the customer experience and work backwards. The one thing I can definitely tell you is the vast majority of traditional banks that I bank with, and they will remain nameless definitely do not do that. I still have to go and take a check down to the bank. Um, mobile banking basically was something basically that in my bank, my particular sort of bank's cases, they rolled out a few years ago basically and they were pretty much, they, had, they did it kicking and screaming. Um, I have no relationship with my bank and my experience of my bank is junk. Um, and actually they keep taking my money and they spend my money. Um, which then leads us back to sort of Robert's question, yeah, why do we even bank with them in the first place? You know, which then, funnily enough, kind of leads to some of these scores. You know, 73% of millennials basically actually could see themselves banking with Google, you know, Apple, even Nike. I mean, Nike have never even shown an interest in financial services, but 73% of millennials say that if Nike actually opened some form of new financial service offering or created one, that, you know, hey, they might try it. Um, you know, 71% of people, and these are HSBC and Accenture's figures, by the way, 71% basically of millennials say they'd rather have a, they'd rather go to the dentist than go and have a conversation with their bank. And yet, surely, in a money-driven capitalist world, money makes the world go round. That should, that should be flipped the other way around. 71% of them should want to have a conversation with their bank. Um, and then when we start having a look at, you know, the rates of switching. 50% uh, of millennials are looking to switch. 18% already have switched. And these guys basically are the people who are going to Starling Bank, Monzo, you know, these kinds of sort of newer sort of startups or newer organizations. Um, in 2016, Venmo became a word, you know, Venmo, Venmo me some money. Um, and then, you know, as we start having a look at some of the other figures, um, it's 56% of people are worried that their money and or data is going to be stolen. So, you know, we have a lot of people who are very worried about the security of their money, which is an opportunity. Um, and as for robo-advisors, you know, even though we have some interesting robo-advisors, for example, NatWest has a robo-advisor that can advise you on mortgages, 14% um, of people, according to HSBC, 14% of people would rather actually be operated on by a robot heart surgeon, and actually there is one of those coming through. Um, only 11% of people would actually trust a robo mortgage, a, a robo advisor. Um, but these figures will inevitably tip, tick up. From a customer experience as well, no one wants to see this. Everyone hates waiting now. If you've got to wait for more than five seconds for what comes next, you're probably going to tune out. Um, so real time is the new minimum. Hyper personal is the new personal. Um, customers don't want to expend any effort. These are opportunities, we'll get into this. Um, they don't want to spend any effort doing whatever it happens to be. Um, transparency is standard. You know, From a bank's perspective, if I give my bank my money, I want to know what they're actually doing with it. You know, so for example, we've seen loads of banking scandals recently where bank after bank after bank has been done because they've been laundering and or loaning money basically to a serious organized crime. Am I a party to that because I gave them my hundred pounds? You know, no bank has transparency as standard. 
And yet, when you have a look at retail, when you have a look at all these different industries, people talk up about the desire to, be, to understand where their food came from. How was it grown? How was it transported? Yeah, where were my clothes made? You know, were, were they made sustainably and everything else? The concept of transparency within the banking environment from a consumer perspective, not a regulator perspective, but a consumer perspective, doesn't exist. You know, unless you talk about, uh, you know, these PFM dashboards that we see, but that's not really transparency. That's just telling me where I spent my money. Um, from a consumer perspective, this is what I want. I want to give you my money. I want you as a bank to then make me more money, like a good amount of money, you know, not a couple of pence, basically, for every thousand euros that I deposit, if that. Um, and then I want you to be able to help me save money. So the saving money, we're starting to see those already coming through. But name me a bank that you could put $100 with or 100 euros or 100 pounds with and you'd get a good return on. I can't think of any unless you talk about some of the challenger banks who are offering high interest rates just to sort of you know, bump up their liquidity. Um, yeah, we are kind of stuck today in this Medici model of I give you my money and you do stuff with that and it really doesn't benefit me. That's the opportunity to flip customers. Fintechs basically still don't see this as uh, this opportunity. Um, and then from a customer experience, increasingly we have everything is being provided to us via digital. Everything is connected. You can be like this lady here and technology helps us decentralize all manner of services. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you step back 10, 20 years ago and you're, in the, you're on a sand dune and I said, be productive, you uh, and I came back in an hour's time, you wouldn't have really have done anything. You'd just be sitting on the sand dune looking at the sunset. Whereas now, if you've got a smartphone basically and you're connected, um, you can read a book, you can take a course, you can do some share dealing uh, on Robin Hood, perhaps, you know, while after reading Reddit. Um, you can start booking appointments. You could order goods and services to be delivered to you on that sand dune by drone from Amazon or wherever your favorite shop resides. In addition to that, you know, this lady could actually be using her phone to give herself a health check, a physical and mental health check. You could build these into a banking app. And what I mean by that is these things are packed with sensors. Uh, cameras, microphones, and everything else. If you take artificial intelligence and I talk into this, this AI can actually tell whether or not I'm getting ill, can tell whether I am ill. From my voice, it can tell me whether I have COVID, thanks to Caltech. Um, it can tell me if I'm starting to see the onset of dementia. Can you imagine a banking app that says, you know, every time you log in, we're going to give you a very quick 10 second health check just to make sure that you know you're okay from a health and mental uh, from a health perspective a physical health perspective and a mental health perspective um, I can use the camera on the smartphone to look at it and uh, using machine vision it can tell me whether I have pancreatic cancer it can tell me my heart rate my blood pressure all kinds of things can you imagine doing business with a bank that says every time you bank every time you open your banking app we will give you a quick free health check. These technologies are already here. And then if it detects something funny, it could say, well, you know, I think actually you're, you're looking a little bit ill um, for whatever reason. You've got an inherited genetic condition, maybe. Um, you know, would you like us to put a little bit more money into your health plan or into your savings or pension plans or whatever it happens to be? You can start doing some interesting things with that. Um, when we start talking about new interfaces, this is Anna. Um, I hired her about six months ago. Um, she's a digital human, didn't really cost much to make. Uh, but what about this as a banking app? Now, when you start thinking about all the different data points that you can gather on people, I could take LinkedIn data, I could take health and wellness data, I could do something like this. Morning, John. Here's a quick two minute summary of all of today's news from your LinkedIn network. I also noticed you seem stressed and heard your company's planning redundancies. Would you like to review your investments, savings, healthcare benefits, and pension plans? They're in the dashboard, and if you like, we can review them together and look for better alternatives. So that's the future interface, and it's already starting to emerge. And we can put a neural network 
brain into Anna and she can actually start having real conversations with us. I can go through options and say, yes, but what about this? What about that? In a little bit of a way, that, in, in a similar way to some of the conversations you can start having with IBM Watson, for example. Um, but from a, if you remember the, the survey, um, about 50 to 60% of people were worried about their accounts being hacked and you know, them losing money and all that kind of stuff. That's a good use of Anna as a digital human. Let's flip that on its head. So let's start defrauding people now at scale. Hi, I'm Tanya from Banco do Brazil. Thank you for clicking the link we sent you. We noticed some odd activity on your account with us. So as a precaution, we've set you up a new account and just need your authorization to protect your money while we investigate the matter further. And don't worry, your money is perfectly safe still. Thank you in advance for your cooperation. We appreciate it. So now we can start using artificial intelligence, neural networks, big data, digital humans, conversational artificial intelligence, and all manner of things, basically from a criminal enterprise perspective, to defraud you and fish you in new personal, hyper-personalized ways. Because these digital humans can, again, use webcam feeds. They can use sensors within the environment, basically, to try to figure out your emotional state. Uh, yeah, is what they're saying resonating? You know, do they need to change their scripts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and from a consumer perspective, there's not much protection offered about this. If you are conned, even today, you go to, say, for example, the local police force, um, say, I've been scammed out of 10,000 euros, and the local police force goes, ooh, can't really do much about that. That's an opportunity for banks, which, we'll, again, we'll come to in a moment. Tech attacks again. So as a bank, you know, you are insured. Um, as individuals, generally, we're insured. Now, we can start cloning. So as you start looking at protecting your systems and your mobile apps using new biometric type systems, um, I can clone most of your biometric data, whether it is your face, your fingerprints, your voice, in a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes tops. Um, and here's an example, basically, of where a criminal gang cloned the voice of a, of a European energy CEO. They then got that cloned voice to phone the CEO of the British subsidiary of this energy company. And this was, you can look at this, this is in uh, Wall Street Journal and so on and so forth. Um, and that CEO asked that other CEO to transfer 257,000 pounds into a Ukrainian bank account. The first time they did it, it didn't really work. So they changed the scripts and all that kind of stuff. It actually worked on the second time. And in this particular case, Eula Hermes paid out to cover the costs. But to the CEO of the UK subsidiary transferred at his alleged CEO's request, who was fake, £257,000. So when we start talking about being able to use people's biometrics to hack the voice systems, especially on your mobile apps, we're already there. So how do you secure some of this stuff as we start looking at the future? Um, from a health and longevity perspective as well, huge numbers of breakthroughs, basically in healthcare and biotechnology, mean that we are living longer and we are going to continue to live longer. And that has implications, basically, for the financial services industry for a whole variety of fairly obvious reasons, whether it's pensions, mortgages, savings, and planning, all that kind of stuff. Um, now, by 2028, the vast majority of particularly European and American health, te health tech and biotech companies believe that we are going to reach something called escape velocity. So in 2028, what that means is that new healthcare technologies will be able to add more than a year's worth of life to an individual for every year that they live. Um, and when we start having a look at some of these technologies, we're quite quickly seeing 100 is becoming the new 65. If you have any elderly, uh, elderly uh, gentlemen and ladies basically within the bank, um, go and ask them and say, you know, you're 60, 70, you know, maybe older. Um, how do you feel? You know, the vast majority of elderly people I speak to say, you know what, mentally, I kind of still feel mentally like I'm 20, 30 years, you know, 20 to 30 years old. But physically, my body doesn't actually, uh, you know, tell that same story. So um, just like cars, you know, if you can understand more about the human body, we can replace more of it with the human body. So 
Uh, today, we can already replace 70% of the human body with artificial parts, you know, whether it's metal hips, basically, or even some of the more advanced things like these. So using CRISPR and gene editing technology, we are already creating designer humans in the UK, Mexico, and China uh, that are immune to certain diseases, but also who have been genetically engineered so they don't carry inherited genetic conditions. Um, so we are already in the world of designer humans, and that just accelerates and accelerates. Um, when we look at digital health, increasingly I can digitize you as an individual, and that digital version of you, that avatar of you, becomes a baseline. So next time you go to hospital and you have scans and everything else, we can compare those different baselines, and we're doing this in the US. And I can say, well, last time you were here, you were fine, but we've actually detected these new things here. Um, and there might be, you know, clots. Uh, they might be, you know, your heart might be beating irregular, whatever it happens to be. But, you know, we can detect that there's actually been a change in your baseline. And artificial intelligence is now already starting to get to the point where they can say, because you've got this, this, and this, people in that type of condition normally live with those conditions for about 20 years or two years. Uh, so we, by digitizing the human, we can fundamentally revolutionize healthcare in new ways. And then the coronavirus, just as a weird fact, uh, was the first virus to be ever digitized. And that's actually what contributed to uh, some of the vaccine drives. That's why rather than taking 10 years to create a vaccine, everything speeds up. Remember, it took 10 months. Um, when we start talking about human hearts, we can already 3D print human hearts. We can 3D print bone, cartilage, cattle. We can print 3D print skin, all kinds of different things. So we're already at the point where if you have go into hospital, for example, in the UK and throughout Europe, and you need and you have bones removed uh, because they are cancerous, we just 3D print your new bone from your own pluripotent stem cells, and we put that in. Um, hearts, basically, we, over in Israel, they recently 3D printed a miniature human heart. Today it's this big, tomorrow it's that big, then it's that big, etc. And in 10 to 20 years time, when you have a heart attack, the hospital will say, you don't have to wait any longer for a new heart, liver, pancreas, kidney. Uh, we'll just print you off a new one. And there's no fear of rejection because it's printed on a 3D bioprinter from your own stem cells. In vivo gene editing, two years ago, uh, we used some of these these very, very powerful gene editing tools to cure a man of Hunter's syndrome. Now, Hunter's syndrome is a genetically inherited condition, and there's good news and bad news. The good news is that you will die in 20 years with Hunter's syndrome. The bad news is you will die really painfully. So by using in vivo gene editing, they just put this patient in a bed, put him onto an intravenous drip that contained this gene editing serum. Uh, after half an hour, it clipped out the faulty genes, clipped in new genes, uh, and a year later, he no longer has Hunter's syndrome, so he's no longer going to die. Um, these, uh, these types of remedies are also coming through for things like cystic fibrosis, Huntingdon's, all that kind of stuff. And this single technology helps us cure over 6,000 inherited genetic diseases, as easy as lying in a bed for half an hour having a cup of tea. That's life extension right there. Paralysis, we are using stem cells, we're using carbon nanotubes and all manner of different things. If you are paralyzed, I have so many case studies now where people aren't, who were paralyzed are no longer paralyzed because of new technologies. Um, again, you know, we live in a sci-fi world. Tricorders in my pocket, I've already demonstrated how using sensors, artificial intelligence and machine vision on your phone you can give yourself a very, very quick primary and secondary healthcare checkup. Um, that disintermediates healthcare, by the way, and it actually puts telehealth and telepsychiatry, for example, on steroids. Um, vaccines at the speed of disease, you know, it took us eight months to generate a vaccine for COVID, albeit under extreme circumstances with investment, urgency, and all those sorts of things. Um, but as quantum computers start coming through, we can already see a time where we should be able to reproduce the proteins that are associated with a particular disease and create universal vaccines within days and weeks. And then we have to go to human trials, but again, we have 
we have labs on chips, which mean that we don't need to trial some of these vaccines on 30,000 people like we do, like we have today. Um, when we look at products of the future, um, low Earth orbit satellite systems like the ones from SpaceX, OneWeb in the UK, they're going to hook up another 4 billion customers to the internet by, in the next 10 years. That's your opportunity. 3.5 billion people connected today, tomorrow, 7 billion. Um, are you attacking that as an opportunity? Uh, investment options that matter. Increasingly, when we speak to consumers, I said they talk about you know, wanting to do things that matter, either for themselves, their family, or the, and or society at large, and or the planet. Um, if I put my money into a bank, I have no idea what it's used for. Yeah? Um, as we saw basically with a lot of the court cases a little while ago, could be being used to, or to uh, finance organized crime, albeit by accident. Um, I'd rather that it goes to a, it's used for worthwhile purposes. So this is where we go into the area of ESG investing from a shareholder perspective and from a global asset management perspective. Sovereign ID as a service. Um, we've already demonstrated in a number of different ways that I, as a bank, I trust you. I trust you with my data. I trust you with my money. I've also demonstrated I don't actually trust Facebook or the fat bag collective with my data. So why don't banks develop sovereign ID as a service? You are the keeper of our identities. And if you put this onto a blockchain, you can actually, every time someone requests data about me, I have a system that says, give it to them, don't give it to them, or give it to them, but then rescind it after two days, whatever it happens to be. So there is an opportunity for banks to do new things basically with trust, the value of currency that the Medici's originally sort of tapped into. Um, privacy, yeah, you can use these sovereign ID systems to help keep my stuff private, you know, me private. Um, none of the competitors that you're gonna come up against in the future, for example, you know, the fat bag collective again, yeah, they aren't interested in keeping my private, day, private stuff private, they actually want more of it. Um, you can tie them up in knots in this one. Security. As individuals, we are all getting more and more scammed. Um, when we have 4 billion new people coming on, the UK Home Office reckons basically that over 250 million people will end up becoming cyber criminals. Because you can go around the world and say, I tell you what, would you like to make $1,000 this month as opposed to the $1.50 a day that you are going to be making, depending on the part of the world that you're living in. So security, you know, banks are great at security. Yeah, you know, they have to be. Yeah, you know, it's part of the trust and privilege model. So why not actually offer users a way, you know, a way to prevent them from being scammed? Um, and trust as a service. Now, SME banking. Yeah, you know, traditional banks should actually start exp expanding their SME banking businesses. Now, I know a lot of them do this already. This is where fintechs are going next because they're going for the consumer and then they're going to be going for the SME banking, the SME banking business and they're going to make it really slick and elegant. Um, Multi-sided marketplaces. Yeah, there are no boundaries between different digital things any longer, digital industries any longer. So, you know, why are you just a bank? Um, you know, why aren't you offering different services? And I don't just necessarily mean tying up different parts of an ecosystem. Why don't you actually have a liquidity or an equity position in particular alternative industries and companies? Um, I mean, if you have a look at the fat bags, they are the multi-sided model incarnate. Um, and this is where you can actually start getting into something like this, which is rather kitsch. Uh, life as a service. You can help me make money. You can help me save money. But for example, you know, my banks, they can use GPS on my phone when I walk into a particular supermarket, they should be able to know. Why can't they push a notification to me that say, says, I just noticed that you walked into a Tesco's. Um, Tesco's have done a deal with us. You can save 5% on your shopping at the checkout. That's easy. That's just part, that's an update to a banking app. Um, but when you start thinking outside of the box, there's all sorts of different life as a service opportunities you can do. Um, whether it's in the retail space, the car space, the transportation space, the healthcare space, and so on and so forth. Um, when we start having a look at mortgages, you know, what about this one? Um, name your price. We'll build, you know, as a bank, we have a partnership with a 3D printed building company. Name your price. 
Um, this is actually a house that is 3D printed. It was 3D printed in New York. It was 3D printed and it's now on sale for, it's, it's now on sale on Zillow for half the price of its neighbor. And the neighbor's house basically was made in a traditional way. Using 3D printing, when we have a look at the, the valuation of assets, you know, today I will come to you and I'll say, I want a half a million pound mortgage or euro mortgage. Um, what if actually I only needed 250,000 euros as a mortgage because we're using 3D printing, which allows us to 3D print buildings and homes in a day for a tenth of the cost that it costs to build a traditional home. And here's an example. <laughs> So 3D printed buildings can be built faster, they can be built cheaper. And when we start having a look at the impact of these on the neighborhoods, what happens basically if you're a bank, for example, you have valued all of the mortgage assets on your books based on current risk models. You know, a house in this neighborhood is half a million euros because all the other houses in the neighborhood are half a million euros. But all of a sudden, as we start seeing 3D printed buildings popping up everywhere from the Netherlands all the way through to France, the Ukraine, the US, Dubai, et cetera, et cetera, what happens if all of a sudden that half a million euro home is surrounded by 250,000 euro identical copies that have been 3D printed? What does that do for the value of the mortgages on your books? Um, and this technology is accelerating. Now, if we all live longer, why would most banks still offering a 25 to 35 year mortgage? Why not a 50 year mortgage? Why couldn't I, as an individual, as a young individual, buy a house for less money than I could buy a car? You know, um, this is where, as a bank, you could actually create a partnership actually, with a variety of different 3D printing companies, and there are plenty across Europe, um, to start changing the dynamic. I mean, imagine that basically as a marketing message. You know, we will give you a mortgage. The mortgage basically is going to be at the same rate that we would normally push it out at, except for the fact that you, know, you need less deposit. Um, we'll do a 50 year mortgage, um, which means you also earn more interest on that. Um, but actually you can buy that house for less than, it's going to, less, than, less than the cost of your car. That's a differentiator. Microtransactions, you know, for example, basically as a bank, are you even looking at the microtransaction space? Now, when we have a look at things like the Internet of Things, for example, there are microtransactions are becoming much more popular. If you think about the AWS servers that you are using, if you think about the sensors basically in, the, in different parts of your building, they are all gathering little bits of compute and resource from wherever they're gathering it from. Those are tiny, tiny microtransactions. And microtransactions vary from a billionth of a euro all the way through to you know, kind of a couple of euros. Um, most banking systems are not set up basically to do, you know, millions, hundreds of millions or even billions of microtransactions. And yet now over 50% of all of the world's transactions are brokered and or managed by machines and machine systems. Um, so as we start looking at the Internet of Things, let's talk about how I can get, uh, how I can develop a product that makes you rich. So I have a smart fridge, um, traditional kind of connected home type of product. Now, do you remember the time I said that your fridge made you rich? This is the Internet of Things era that we live in. So for example, I said your smart fridge knows I said that you have run out of milk. Um, so it's connected to the blockchain and we have companies like Samsung who are doing this kind of stuff. Um, it's connected to the blockchain and it says to you, you know, 
you've run out of milk, I can automatically reorder that milk for you if you like. Um, but it can do this, and this is the killer. It can say, normally, I know that you buy milk for one euro. Um, however, because it's connected to the blockchain and it's connected to millions of other fridges across Europe, it can form a buying consortium. It can now go to the milk producers and say, we want to buy milk 10, euro, 10 euros cheaper than we normally do, and we're going to buy tens of millions of pints you know, or litres or whatever it happens to be. Now it, that fridge comes back to you and it says, you know, I got your deal. Uh, you normally pay a euro for your milk. I got it for 90 cents. And it can do this with all your other groceries. Um, what would you like me to do with that 10 cents? Would you like me just to keep that in your bank account? Yeah. Or would you like me to put it into some form of investment pot for you? You know, low risk, medium risk, high risk, or should I just choose? Because, you know, I've got so much data about you, I know what kind of, what, how risk averse you are. Um, just using the UK model, this kind of system unlocks over 386 billion pounds in potential revenues and opportunities. So your fridge, can, by creating or by turning itself into a buying consortium that saves you money that you can then invest and or do whatever you want with, makes you rich. And this is uh, a Lamborghini. This is just a bit of fun. This is a Lamborghini Terzo Millenio. Um, it is the world's first batteryless hypercar because unlike most of the electric vehicles that you'll have, like Teslas, which run on lithium ion batteries, the shell of this car is its battery. So when we talk about disruption, disruptions everywhere, that's just a little bit of fun. Uh, but you could buy one of those. Your fridge could help you buy one of those. Um, as we start having a look at things like NFTs, so non-fungible tokens, um, NFT loans, you know, would you actually loan somebody money to go and buy Jack Dorsey's first tweet, for example? Um, it's a little bit of a craze at the moment, but again, you know, are you asking yourselves these questions? Um, and then when we start having a look at spatial computing, increasingly as we enter into this sort of uh, IoT world using 5G, augmented reality glasses, et cetera, et cetera, you can literally just look at the world, the system pops up a, you know, there's a camera over there, um, this camera is a Panasonic camera, these are the specs, you know, would you like to buy it? It's in stock somewhere. You click yes, you know. So again, it's sort of kind of a different variation on a payment platform. Um, then we have the VR malls. You know, if you have a look over in China, for example, they're already developing VR malls and you just go into a VR virtual reality mall, you pretty much blink an eye and that's how you pay for whatever it is that you've been looking at. These are sort of further out, basically from a European and US perspective, but nevertheless, you know, just putting it out there. Um, but when we talk about uh, technology, technology gets faster, gets cheaper, more ubiquitous, and it gets smaller. These are the first augmented reality contact lenses from Mojo Vision. So these have augmented reality built into them. Um, the next one, virtual reality headsets, they're really bulky. You know, you've got to think about the usability of some of these new technologies. These are virtual reality glasses from Facebook Labs. They are literally just glasses that you put on. They look a bit geeky, but yeah, technology miniaturizes and development of those technologies accelerates exponentially. Now, this is a sort of final section. So how do we compete with fat bags? Bearing in mind that normally for F we'd have Facebook, but we can also substitute in Fortnite, as I mentioned. How do you compete with fat bags? So firstly, remember this, technology is a force multiplier and it's a leveler. Um, to in time, technology changes industry economics by reducing the cost, effort, and speed of transactions to zero. Giving you examples, how much does it cost you compared to 100 years ago to get a glass of water? Nothing. How much does it cost you to light your home today versus having to go out, earn loads of money to buy a candle 200 years ago? Nothing. Um, how much does it cost you to access all of the world's information via Google? Nothing. Uh, when we have a look at the cost of electricity generation with renewables, we're pretty much at zero. You know, go and have a look up cost of renewable energy generation. You'll just see graphs that do that. In time, you know, how much does it cost me to do a pancreatic cancer scan using my phone and artificial intelligence and the camera? Nothing. So remember this slide. Um, 
Technology is a force multiplier and it's also a leveler. So when we're competing with the fat bags, um, firstly, in today's world, you've got to be selfless. Um, easy to say, difficult to do. I understand that because we all have a bottom line, let's say, that we have to look at. And what does that really mean anyway? But this is where you have to act in the interests of your customer rather than yourselves. Um, you've got to have purpose. You know, what's your purpose? What do you stand for? You know, there are so many different causes and campaigns and everything else nowadays. You know, particularly when you have a look at the younger generations, basically they want to be dealing with organizations basically that have a purpose, that do social good. Even the European Parliament, as well as the UK, the US, have said that when we come out of COVID, we want everything to be a green and sustainable recovery. We want everyone to benefit from the recovery. Even the governments are now dictating that investment companies like BlackRock, like Legal and General, should actually primarily invest in companies that are ESG friendly. Um, so next thing, stop thinking like a bank. And what I mean by that is just what I said at the start. Digitization erodes every single border and boundary between every single industry. When I ask you, what industry are you in? If you want to compete with the fat bags, you've got to say all of them. But getting to the point where you suddenly see the world from the potential for the potential that it is, where you can just digitize something and tack on a service to do this, or tack on a service to do that, to offer that and something new. You've got to change the culture, you've got to change your mindset, and you've got to get uncomfortable because your status quo, your comfy, comfy space basically is what you've known for decades. It's being a bank. That's what you're good at. You're not good at being a retailer because that's another industry. But increasingly, the fat bags basically do just say, we are in every industry. You've got to get comfortable being outside of your own industry and starting to think like a fat bag. Um, automate the stack. You know, when you have a look at Amazon, Amazon is it is amazing at focusing on saving even the smallest percentages because in their business it scales up. If they save 0.1% of the time to ship a product or to box a product, then over billions of products, basically it all adds up automate the stack. Um, when we have a look at legacy codes, you know, every bank basically has some form of mainframe and legacy platform knocking around somewhere. I know that Lloyd's Bank, for example, have, have over a billion pounds worth of legacy gear. Um, using artificial intelligence, uh, companies like IBM uh, with AMA, as well as Facebook, Facebook has created something called a transcoder. And just like a universe, a human universal translator, Facebook's transcoder is an artificial intelligence that translates old legacy code into new code um, that can be run on modern systems. The US military, you know, how many times have you actually gone out as a business to have conversations with startups who focus on the defense space? Because over in the US, DARPA is increasingly trying to find new ways, for example, to, to disassociate old legacy code from the underlying hardware. Um, we also have autonomous network configuration systems coming along. So again, artificial intelligence does a lot more basically than just help you automate stuff um, or turn stuff into autonomous stuff. Um, buy everything in as a service. If you're buying a product or service and it does not help you become fundamentally more agile where you can spot a new opportunity tomorrow and you can be leveraging that opportunity in two to three days time, rethink it. And this is sort of where basically we then kind of get into things like, you know, you've got to get really uncomfortable today. Every single industry is being disrupted without exception. Healthcare, transportation, mobility, government, you know, governments are being disrupted by virtual nations. Facebook with 2.2 billion people is a virtual nation. Um, get really, really uncomfortable. Think about this. This isn't easy to think about from a cultural perspective. What would you do today if you started from scratch? And it's definitely not really building what you've built five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, but this should be an end, this should be a, an end point. So you have a, a legacy setup today or an existing setup and status quo today. You can't start from scratch, let's face it. But if you were able to start from scratch, this would be your new state. We call this bit in the middle crossing the chasm because you live in the, you've got, should we say, a foot in the old world you want both feet in the new world, how do you get from A to B? Um, and that's a strategy. We call it crossing the chasm and there's, well, there's ways to do that. 
um, by running things in parallel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when we have a look at ecosystems, partner like crazy. Build disruptive, non-traditional ecosystems. Um, if you have a look at Royal Bank of Scotland's accelerator, for example, it's rather unique in the fact that from their perspective, uh, they actually invite almost anyone from any industry into their banking accelerator because all those people on the one hand are using their products or could be. Um, but again, if we look at this fat bag model of I'm in every industry, why aren't you going and forming partnerships with a, a transportation or mobility company? Whatever those partnerships look like, that's a debating point. Um, also, from a fat bag perspective, you've got to attack the save more, say, yeah, save more, earn nothing model. Because as a bank, your model is based on bank with us and we will give you a return of 2% interest as a new customer. Nah. It's kind of interesting, but it's not that interesting. As Amazon though, I could say, transfer your primary bank account to Amazon. Firstly, we'll give you a bit of money, but maybe we won't. However, if you bank with us as Amazon, we will save you five, 10, 20% on the products that you buy. We'll show you the special offers. So with Fatbag, Fatbag could actually start thieving your customers without offering them any interest. They can just spin up savings. They can say, we're not going to make you money, but we're going to save you more money than you would have made basically with your old bank. And then they could, you know, the, with the market caps that some of these guys have, what would stop Amazon with a $1.6 trillion market cap saying to its 97 million Prime subscribers, we'll give you $1,000 if we become your primary bank? How do you defend against that? Um, and then final one, um, we're in a new millennium. What about a new name? Um, you know, when we start talking about banks, you know, it used to be the case basically that, you know, say for example, as XYZ bank, it in signals that you are a bank. But now we live in a digital world basically where all the industry boundaries are starting to erode and vanish. Should the word bank actually be at the end of your name, particularly as you start looking at some new products and services. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to be going to questions now.